I've been singing that song for a long time. Has anybody else been singing that song for a long time? I think that was one of the first songs with Jesus Loves Me and those type of songs. He loves all the children of the world, those types of songs. But you know, sometimes it's hard to understand. That is the main thing. <laughs> that is the main thing. It was interesting. Years ago, I read a book called The Mark of a Christian. And I loved it because it had Mark in the title, but uh, no, the, it said the Mark of a Christian, and in the Mark of the Christian, it was just on one thing, that we love each other, and that's what Jesus said. They will know you are my disciples if you love one another. So I'm excited today to start this new series, um, but before I do, uh, I just want to remind you all that in the back of your program, um, you can take notes if you'd like to do that. And then I got some extra scripture that you can study along with uh, throughout the week if you desire to dig a little bit deeper. Um, but before we open up the word of God, I just want to ask that God will speak to us today. So let's ask God to speak to our hearts and our minds. Father, um, even though I'm going to do the majority of the speaking, I pray, dear Lord, that you will speak to me this morning and speak to our hearts and to our minds. Um, your word says we're all like a field. And those fields represent our hearts. And so, dear Lord, I know that this morning some of us maybe have hard hearts and our, our soil is a little bit hard. I, I know some of us have maybe an emotional heart this morning, and some of us have a busy heart. Yet there's some of us that have what you call a good heart, a healthy heart. Whatever our hearts are at this morning, I pray that you will break through and fertilize our hearts this morning so that the Word of God can, can touch it and help us to grow and to, to bear much fruit for your glory. And may we have a rich, rich, rich harvest because we have spent time in the Word of God. So now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, may it be pleasing in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Jesus asked one important question of his disciples. And that question is, who do you say that I am. If Jesus Christ was here today and he was actually the guest speaker and he says, well, who do you say that I am? What would you say? You know, the disciples, they, they didn't want to get very personal, did they? Well, they say, well, well, some people say you're Elijah or you're Moses or you're a great prophet or you're a new type of prophet. Obviously, the people, even those who weren't Christ followers, they would call him rabbi, teacher. It's an important question still today. Who do people say that Jesus Christ is? But one of the things I don't know if we realize, that important question was what Jesus decided to build his church upon. And so when we think about church, I hope this morning when I talk about loving your church and loving your pastor over the next few weeks that, that you're not going to be thinking about this building. I hope you're not going to be thinking about the pew <laughs> that maybe you're sitting at. Or thinking about the child dedication that occurred here or maybe the baptism that occurred here or your Sunday school classroom or the children's nursery, are all the things associated with the building and sort of the church gatherings. But what I want you to think about this morning is who Jesus Christ is. Because that answer determines your perspective on the church. And so if you can clearly say, like Peter ended up saying, well, you're the Messiah, the Christ. Well, we don't go around using that terminology very often, but uh, Messiah Christ meant he was the one that God had promised to save the people from their sins and to restore the kingdom of God. 
and to save the nation of Israel from all their pain, all their anguish. And so when Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of God, he said, basically, Peter, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I decided, though, this morning not to start with that passage. I start with that question because it's crucial to to understand where we're going. I'm going to start before we get to the church and what exactly the church is. I'm going to start with love. And I forget, I, I, I speak quite often, I can't remember all the illustrations I always use, but love has always been a hard word for me. And I don't know if I've shared this before, but I didn't grow up in a home where my mom and dad ever said, Mark, I love you. Good German Lutheran home, and it was sort of stoic, and I don't want to say it was cold, but... You know, we sort of grew up, um, my mom was a a child of an alcoholic, and so we sort of grew up with the rules, if you're familiar with that. Don't touch, don't feel, don't talk. And so I grew up, I really didn't know what love was all about. And when I started dating Michelle, I'm saying, I want to say I love you, but (laughs) I've never heard those words myself, and I don't even know if I know what I'm saying when I say I love you. I don't know about you, but... That word love has always been tricky for me. And so I want to talk about what it means for us to love our church and to love our pastor. Now, we're not going to be talking a lot about the pastor yet. That's going to be in upcoming weeks, but hopefully you will understand. I'm your transitional interim pastor, so... I'm talking about how you're going to love your future pastor. And so I don't want anybody to be misconstrued as I talk about that. So today I'm going to start with a song. It's a Tina Turner song. What's love got to do with it? I don't know if any of you, I think she probably sung that somewhere in the 70s and 80s, sort of when I was growing up. And if you ever saw the video of that, or if you've ever seen Tina Turner sing this song, What's Love Got to Do With It, Got to Do With It, she's sort of singing it with an attitude. (laughs) I sort of like, you don't sound very loving um, singing this song. But it's interesting, she is talking about love from what I would say the world has confused love. She's talking more about lust. She's, She's talking about the the physical side, maybe, of what has been defined as love. But she's like, what does love have to got, what has it got to do with it? It's just a secondhand emotion. What's love got to do with it? Who needs a heart? Who needs, who needs somebody in your life because your heart is just going to be broken? And as I was just thinking about that song, as I was getting ready to, to start this series, I thought it was a great place to start because I think for, for some of us, when it comes to the church, it's just very hard because we don't want to get emotionally attached. And there's many reasons we don't want to get emotionally attached or we got a lot of emotions when it comes to the church and our love for the church is a secondhand emotion. So it... So again, some of the things I talked about, maybe because your child was dedicated here, or maybe you went to the altar here, or maybe you had a close relationship with one of the former pastors. Maybe you had a close relationship with somebody in the church and they decided to leave the church, or you had a close relationship with someone in the church and they went through a divorce, or there was adultery, or there was some issue that happened, or maybe you were burnt financially. I know that for my grandparents, um, on my mom's side, they both came from really uh, conservative families. They were church-going families. Um, My grandmother, I always joke around, she was a black from Alabama, um, but her last name was Black. Uh, But uh, she was a black from Alabama, and she went to probably, I think it was a strong Baptist uh, type of a church down there. 
very committed family. Uh, but something happened. And the same thing happened for my grandfather as well. He was part of Fairview Church of God. It's interesting, on my mom's side, Fairview Church of God, which is in Yoder, Indiana, not too far from here. And his family were churchgoers. But something happened where they were no longer going to church. And the best I, I could ever get from them was it was something that was sexual or something financial. And so their whole married life, they never, ever went to church. They didn't want to have anything to do with church. Why? Because of their emotions, their hearts were broken. But what I want us to see this morning is there is value in loving your church and loving your pastor and us loving one another. And instead of talking specifically about a verse that refers to the church, I'm going to talk indirectly about this concept of love and how it relates to the church. You see, loving your church and loving other Christians in the church, this has been an issue for a long time. It goes all the way back to the days of Jesus. If, if loving came naturally once we accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, why would Jesus repeat the command love one another just as I loved you why would he repeat that if it, if it would come naturally once we accept Christ it's because it doesn't and his best friend whoever um, what a distinction to be known as Jesus's best friend he was the apostle John and, and John the theme of his ministry was that we need to love one another. And when we get to 1 John, where we're going to turn right now, when we get to 1 John, he focuses in on our love for one another. So if you would, open up your Bibles this morning to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. There's two ways to look at the, the epistle of 1 John. Some people look at the epistle of 1 John to, to figure out whether you're actually a believer or not. And so if you're walking in the light, if you're pursuing righteousness, if you're loving others, then it, it's a guarantee that you are a believer in Christ. There's a second way to look at 1 John. And that way is to figure out whether you're having fellowship with Jesus Christ. That means you're abiding in Christ, you're remaining in Christ, you're living in Christ. And if you're living in Christ, guess what? You're going to be loving one another. And just so you know, that's sort of the angle that I take on this. First John actually was revolutionary in my life. It changed the way I viewed Jesus Christ and changed the way I viewed my attitude and my behavior. And there's a verse before we get to um, 1 John um, chapter 4. It's found in 1 John 2, 28. So if you're there, great. If not, just listen to me. But this verse changed my life. Because I would have said, growing up Lutheran, that that I was a believer in Jesus Christ. I understood salvation by faith alone, and, which I did, but I didn't understand this concept. It's a very important concept, and it's not only revolutionary, but it is the starting point for the discussion that we're going to have here in just a second. He says in 1 John 2, 28, And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him at shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. But notice in verse 28, it says that we want to have confidence that it's coming. Let's just think about that this morning in the context of what we're talking about. It was revolutionary for me. Because when I was a kid, you know, I, I was doing some partying and I was watching a whole bunch of movies that weren't appropriate and my life was just not going in the right direction. And then this verse popped out at me and it said, Mark, what are you doing? Christ Jesus could come back any moment. 
And I want to, to be going towards Christ in confidence and not shrinking back in shame. This relates to where we're going today. When you think about your relationship with your church and your relationship with your pastor, don't you want to be in a relationship where you are loving your church and loving your pastor and not knowing that you have conflict and division and turmoil and tension as, it, as you think and you relate to the church and to your pastor? You want to meet Jesus Christ with confidence, literally boldness, when he appears. So to get us started, I'm going to read this section, and it's in 1 John 4, 7, and then we're just going to look at some of the verses. 1 John 4, 7. Notice what it says. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God has been made manifest among us that God sent as his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that he loved God, but that he loves, or in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. I just want to read the rest of this so we can see. We're probably not going to talk about it, but it says, By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us or has given us of his spirit. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in his love abides in God, and God abides in him. Notice this, by this, love perfected or made complete, fulfilled with us, so that we may have confidence, there's that word again, we may have confidence for the day of judgment because he, because as he is also, are we in the world. There is no fear in love. This is a verse that gets taken out of context so often. <laughs> there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. So what does love have to do with it? I want to go back now to verse 11. Verse 11. It says this, and I think we will have it on the screen. Um, maybe go back one. It says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Three times in this short verse, it's talking about love. God's love for us as his beloved children. That is made clear in other passages here that to be called the beloved means that it is a family type of love. It is a father's love. It is, it is a love for a child. It is a special kind of love. And it's going to play into this whole description of what it means for us to love each other. But notice this, and in your Bible, if you're, I always encourage you to circle and highlight. But it says, we also ought to love one another. When Michelle and I got married, we actually have, if I would take off my ring, but I can't get my ring off anymore, which is probably a good sign, 
Um, but maybe it's a sign I, get, I put on too much weight. But I, I can't get my ring off anymore. But if I'd get it off and I would show you t- it to you, it has 1 John 4, 7 through 11. And the reason Michelle and I put it on there, probably because of where I was at a little bit, but also where she was at, it is impossible for us to have a marital love unless we first understand that we have been loved by God. This is going to be crucial as we go through this. You cannot say you love your church, love your pastor, love your spouse, love with the biblical definition of love, with a Christ-like love, unless you first recognize God's love for you. But once you recognize that, then you realize we need to have a love for one another. Now I want to go back to where it all starts in verse 7. Notice here in verse 7, it says, Beloved, once again, we are God's children. We're beloved by him. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. This is a very difficult question that uh, maybe needs to be answered at another time. Um, maybe after the service we can talk about this. Uh, Michelle and I had a great discussion. Well, what about unbelievers? Can unbelievers love? And don't you know some unbelievers who are very loving and kind? But there's an aspect of this love that is missing of, of God's love. And we're going to see it in a little bit, what God's love actually is. But it's very interesting, this love for one another is deep and it's rich. And it shows that we have been born again. Remember I started off with, who do you say Jesus is? See, you can't have a deep Christ-like love for one another unless you first know Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you don't understand that Jesus Christ, as we will see here, is the one who died on the cross for your sins and rose again. It is going to be impossible for you to love. And in this context, specifically love fellow believers in Christ. It starts with being born again, being born of God, being born of God's love. And that's why he repeats over and over again, beloved, because they have become God's children. But then he's given the mandate. And John was there when Jesus said, you need to love one another just as I have loved you. The theme of John's ministry, if John was your pastor, he would constantly be reminding you every Sunday, we need to love one another. We need to love one another. Because that is the heartbeat of God. But notice this. It says not only does this person indicate that they've been born of God, but they know God. Notice what verse 8 says. It says, anyone who does not love does not know God. Do you notice what's missing? It doesn't say that they're not born again. It says that they don't know God. That means that they don't know God intimately. The reason Christians struggle to love other Christians or to love their church or to love their pastor is because they have no deep intimacy and knowledge of who God is and his love. And that's the question that we're going to try to answer here this morning. So notice what it says. It says, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. I want to give you three quick thoughts that you need to think about and I would encourage you maybe to write these down because love is based upon who God is and what God does you see if we go back to that Tina Turner song you know love what's love but a secondhand emotion that means it reacts to being loved or to being liked or somebody doing something kind to you What John is saying, no, love is who God is. It's the nature of God. In 1 John, it describes God as being light. 
And it describes God as being love. So God is love. He's also light. He's also wisdom. He's also truth. But what John's trying to emphasize is God is love. And if you can understand that, that is going to be your definition of love. And we're going to talk about that. So God is love, and it's based upon what God does. Well, what does God do? God initiates it. God starts it. God goes first. God doesn't sit there and say, hmm, I wonder if Mark Gagline's going to love me. Aren't you glad about that? God's not sitting back waiting on my response. In fact, he's not even waiting for me to clean up my life. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrated his love in this way. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's based upon who God is and what he does. He initiates, literally, he sends his only son. His only son. Think about that. That's love. Sends his only son to die so that we might live. Here's another thing we need to think about love as we read this passage. Love is captivating. I don't know, you may not use the word captivating too often, but it's beautiful. It's attractive. It it draws us in. Um. If you go back and you look at this passage later today, you'll notice that he uses the word manifest or see or to behold. That song we sung about, that I commented about, they will know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Why? It's captivating. In fact, I was reading a commentary years ago and I was struck by the line. It said the early church grew because people couldn't understand, they couldn't couldn't comprehend the great love that they had for one another. They were drawn to it. Love is is attractive. Love is captivating when we love one another. And notice, so it says in verse 9, in this, the love of God was made manifest. It was revealed. It, It was shown to the world. It's attractive. So when we love our church, and we love our pastor, it's attractive, it's captivating. This is true in marriage, isn't it? If you see a marriage and two people are madly in love or they are deeply in love, isn't that attractive? My kids get on me all the time. I'm one that cries during all these Hallmark movies and all these movies, you know, and I don't know what my issue is, but when I see genuine love, and especially my my daughter, Mackenzie, she says, Dad, you're always going to cry when there's a father and a son or a father and a daughter expressing their love for each other. Why? Because it's captivating, it's attractive, and that's the love that the father has for us. But notice this. Not only is love based upon who God is and what he does and it's captivating, the cross is the picture of this love. Notice this, what it says. It says, God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Notice this. It says, in this love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. This is the picture of God's love, his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. I would encourage you to go, and I didn't have time to do it, um, and I knew it would take too long, but there's a song, Amazing Love. And YouTube it, and it's based upon, or the song's not based upon, but they've taken this YouTube video, and they've used the passion of Jesus Christ. And the passion of Jesus Christ talking about God's amazing love for us. And in this amazing love is the picture of Christ and his thorns and blood coming down his face. Now, propitiation, that's a big word, right? We don't go around throwing that around. Has anybody ever used that word? You know, you're probably going to impress your friends and neighbors. And hey, hey, Christ is our propitiation. They're going to be like, what are you talking about? 
It goes all the way back to Leviticus 16, the Day of Atonement. Propitiation means to be pleased, to be satisfied. And so Christ's love for us, it satisfies, it appeases our sinful nature. So here's what I want us to know about Christ's love. It is unmerited and undeserved. And so as we go through this series, the love of Christ that we're to model is unmerited and undeserved. And we're going to see this with the illustration of marriage, husbands, love your wife. Probably maybe just making it one word. It's unconditional. There's no, there's nothing I can do to merit God's love for me. There's nothing I can do to deserve God's love for me. This is the type of love. And some of you will say, well, my pastor better be a good pastor or I'm not going to love him. (laughs) Those people at church, they better do what I want them to do or I'm not going to love them. No, Christ's love is unmerited and undeserved. But here's something that I'm going to dig deeper in. His love is also spiritual and sacrificial. You see, in the church today, we feel comfortable talking about meeting people's physical needs, material needs. In fact, when we go to our prayer time later, I guarantee you, we're going to focus in on the physical, health or finances or a job. But the heart of God's love was the spiritual need. What was the spiritual need? Our sin needed to be taken care of. <laughs> it needed to be taken away. And throughout the course of this series, I'm going to share the spiritual needs that some of us have, whether it's loneliness, discouragement, hopelessness. As believers, some of us are struggling with that, and we need people to come alongside us. My heart continues to break, especially for some of you that maybe don't get to see your your grandchildren or your children or Go visit a family or loved one in the nursing homes or the hospitals or all of that. That that just is mind-blowing. We're relational beings, and that is a spiritual need when we feel lonely for somebody to come alongside us and minister to us and encourage us. And I think what John wants us to know is that the measure, the measure of love, is Jesus Christ. So as we go through this series, I want us to start with who Jesus Christ is as our Savior and Lord. He's the one who's saying, I will build my church. The church belongs to him. But I also want us to see that he's given us the model or the definition for love in his sacrifice and in his death. And if we can catch this, again, our church is going to be captivating. Our church is going to be attractive. And can we just be honest? If you turn on the news, I don't even see anything about the church anymore unless the church is getting itself in trouble or being judgmental or all of that. That's not what the church is supposed to be about. The church is supposed to be attractive. It's supposed to be healthy. It's a living organism that brings God glory. And if you're saying, Mark, I really don't care about Silver Creek Church of God. Okay, I'll, I'll give you that this morning. Or I don't care about the church. But I guarantee you, if you take this principle and apply it to your marriage, your parenting, it's going to make a world of difference your relationships at work, your neighborhood, your school, whatever it is. Jesus Christ is the model for how we are to love one another. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for the word of God. I thank you for the truth of God. And I pray, dear Lord, as we move through this series, I pray that our hearts will be open and excited to be loving you, and to be loving each other. 
Because when it's all said, that is the commandment. To love you with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Give us that heart this morning. And we pray this in the powerful name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.